And some might find this disturbing, that when the plant entered its emergency condition or status, the procedure was to have been to notify all the plant personnel that were essential to operation safety and or maintenance to come quick to the plant. They were supposed to have been paged in order that they might immediately return. Not a one of them were, according to the reports from the NRC event reports. The employees were not paged. They don't, not, they don't know why that didn't work. What is the significance of not having the staff there during a time of emergency? Well, this time they got lucky, and there's no significance, but the, the, it, it basically they got lucky. Uh, you know, when you have a, a fire of this magnitude, and, and, you know, plants have fires every day, you know, uh, small, that they never call in the outside fire department. But when you call the outside fire department in, that's a big deal. And you're supposed to then get other essential people in to back up your staff. Um, in this case, they happen to skate through without needing those extra people. But, it, you know, it, what amazes me about that is that, um, is that they have a procedure up in the control room. And literally, there's people up there checking in every minute. You can tell by that log. Every minute they were checking in and making sure they were complying with the procedure. And for some reason, somebody uh, missed that step. Now, it, because there's a flood, the NRC has put in extra inspectors on site. So there was an NRC inspector in that control room 24 hours a day, and the NRC inspector didn't see it either. Um, so it was... Um, it's significant. You know, they got lucky. They didn't need those people, uh, but it's more of a you know, thank God as opposed to that's the way things are supposed to work. We are in a set of conditions, particularly weather-wise, climate-wise, runoff, spillage, dams, and uh, runway, uh, runaway water systems, where the condition of Fort Calhoun may be emblematic of other nuclear power plants across the country. The water risk exists at those near the coast, like I believe Seabrook is, uh, with possible water, leving, water levels rising and the ability of uh, unexpected high tides or hurricanes or confluences of events to cause the um, water overflow of a nuclear power plant. We're talking today about a plant on the Missouri River in Nebraska. But just over the past uh, several days, there has been damming and undamming of the Mississippi River in uh, and above uh, Beton Rouge and New Orleans. And uh, there are, as I understand it, uh, two or three uh, nuclear power plants that stand in the water runoff region that could also be affected and put under a condition just like Fort Calhoun. What is your understanding of that, Arnie Gunderson? Yeah, it's you know, all of these plants have to be on a major piece of water because they need that water to cool them. Um, to my mind, the the worst ones in the country are um, in California. Uh, there's a plant um, near San Diego uh, called San Onofre, and um, it has a um, nine meter high tsunami wall. Um, the tsunami that hit Japan was 15 meters high, um, so. You know, their position is, well, our experts have said we'll never see a tsunami as big as nine meters, uh, when in fact we know that the, the Pacific can really get angry and throw something at it. A tsunami of that magnitude in California would knock out all the vital systems uh, required to cool the reactor. But the, probably the, the other one that, that was the, the near miss, if you will, is Turkey Point in Florida. So now we're on the opposite coast. And it wasn't a tsunami. It was a uh, hurricane. Hurricane Andrew pushed a tidal surge um, inland, um, and uh, one, the winds were astronomical, and two, the, the tides were so high that we almost lost um, the, the, that plant, Turkey Point. Um, the, the, um, the security system was knocked out for three months, and the radiation alarms were knocked out for almost as long. Um, and the infrastructure was knocked out. Uh, the plant uh, was down to its diesels, and luckily the diesels ran, and luckily there was uh, um, the, the, the tidal
tidal surge was not quite high enough. Uh, but, you know, if, if it happened, it's likely that Mother Nature can throw out something that's another three feet higher than that. Um, so I don't think we should be complacent saying, wow, we got through this, see, our design is great. I think the lesson here is that, wow, we got through this by the by the hair on our chinny chin chin, and, and we need to uh, really evaluate whether or not we should beat these things up even more. Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Associates, uh, we have alluded to but not yet directly addressed the ongoing uh, situation with the similar fuel pool risks in Fukushima. And uh, since we uh, last spoken in person, there have been tremendous revelations, many of them vindicating the uh, intuitions and inferences that you made long time ago about the meltdowns, about the containment breaches, about the flooding, about the release of hazardous, uh, highly radioactive material. And uh, the crisis is now so apparent, even as far away as the uh, garbage piles of Tokyo, much less the green tea uh, farms or the rice paddies uh, throughout more than just the Kushima, uh prefecture in Japan, that this was a tremendously huge um, breakdown and release of contamination. And uh, it has taken this long for TEPCO and Japanese nuclear so-called regulatory officials to acknowledge this. What is your understanding of the current uh, condition of the various plants, the half dozen of them at uh, uh, Fukushima Daiichi, and uh, now the revelation of uh, thousands of uh, tons of uh, radioactive liquid waste at Daiichi, at the uh, second complex? What's up with uh, Fukushima? Well, we're not going to get the straight story out of the uh, Japanese government. I think that's clear. We're not going to get the straight story out of um, Tokyo Electric. Uh, luckily, um, compared to Chernobyl, we have the Internet now, and there's a, quite a few independent scientists who are getting some very accurate radiation readings and providing a much more accurate um, radiation profile of what went on in Japan. And, and you're right, we've got radioactive sewage showing up at you know, hundreds of miles away, and we've got radioactive fish as far south as Hong Kong. Um, we've got um, the tea leaves. Outside the plant, they found plutonium in the soil, uh, right outside the plant gate, about a mile away from the plant. And in the Fukushima prefecture, they found the radiation in the ditches on the side of the road from road runoff is, is um, about 200 times normal. Uh, so clearly there is an enormous amount of radiation released. Now, a couple scientists are um, have set up air filters in Tokyo and in Seattle, and what they do is they pull in what a lung, what your lungs breathe in the course of a day, which is about 10 cubic meters, and through a filter, that's just like a cigarette filter, and then they open the, the filter up and they look for hot particles. And in April, the, the latest data is from April, a person in Tokyo was breathing in 10 hot particles a day from Fukushima, and that's... Um, you know, what a hot particle is is a piece of radiation um, big enough to do cellular damage in your lungs or your GI tract. And But the interesting number is, so, so Tokyo was getting 10 hot particles a day. Everybody in that city was breathing in. Seattle had five. So here we are an ocean away, and still we're getting hit by hot particles from, from Fukushima. Wait a minute. This Ar is Wait a minute, Artie. You said you said uh, uh, five particles in Seattle, Washington, in the northwestern part of the United States. Uh, where are these measurements coming from? Because it's my understanding that there has been minimal uh, measurement from EPA and other agencies. Uh, please reiterate that. That sounds important. Uh, yeah, the EPA has stopped monitoring, and frankly, they weren't monitoring very well even when they were monitoring. Um, they've gone back to, you know, their normal environmental radiation monitoring. Um, I'm not, and of course the, the FDA is not monitoring any fish or any, uh, um, you know, any produce that's coming into the country from Japan is not being monitored by the FDA. So again, this is, um, independent scientists who are telling me this is what we're measuring. Now, you know, science takes a couple months before these journals get published. Um, 
but um, but I can assure you it's good science. And uh, and yes, we're seeing for April, Seattle was only half the amount of radiation that Tokyo had. Now this isn't you can't walk out with a Geiger counter and hold it up in the air and see it go nuts. A hot particle doesn't behave that way. A hot particle um, is about a micron, which is smaller than the diameter of a hair. It's carried across the the, the Pacific and has a has a, a charge to it. So when you breathe it in, it sticks in your lung, or, or when you um, ingest it, it sticks in your GI tract because of the charge. Um, and it, you can actually go on the internet. There's actually a, a great picture of an ape um, lung with a hot particle in it, and you can see the damage that the hot particle does over the course of a year. Um, not every hot particle causes a cancer, but it's a constant irritant in your lung. And eventually, irritation in your lung leads to COPT or, 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 um, uh, or cancer. So I think um, we cannot underestimate that, that Fukushima is going to cause cancers in the long run in the Northern Hemisphere. Hardy Gunderson, um, I... Uh Note for our audience that your work is being um, uh, celebrated and discussed around the world. Uh, we are aware that you were recently on CNN, a subject of much discussion, and I'm happy to say that one of our interviews is actually being discussed on uh, a German uh, physics uh, website, a blog of scholars of German nu uh, nuclear physicists. And um, I'd just like you to bring people up to date about your latest activities and uh, how one may keep up with uh, your invaluable work. In oh, thank you. I, I, don't let it go to your head, but I, I would have to say that you're one of the smartest interviewers I've, I've ever had. But, uh, our, our website is Fairwinds, F-A-I-R-E, W-I-N-D-S, and um, it's um, uh, we we have we're doing all this for free, my, my wife and I. Uh, but there's a donate button on the site to help our. You know, we're, we we have to pay somebody to keep our website running and things like that. If if anybody cares, uh, there we we try to post a video a couple times a week, and um, uh, basically I say, well, what do I think is important? And I talk for five to fifteen minutes on a on a topic several times a week. Um, like you said, they have been heard around the world, and I'm especially proud that that ours, your your my interview is now being played in Germany because I recall that one, and, and frankly, it, it really touched on what was important. Well, Arnie Gunderson, your work is uh, Promethean. It is uh, liberation, the revelation, and a protection for uh, people uh, who are lied to by authorities who may be in. Um, over their head, much like the uh, Fort Calhoun nuclear power plant soon. So it's, it's with great gratitude and tremendous response from our listeners and uh, people of concern everywhere that we're uh, just uh, happy to be part of this work. Well, well, thank you for caring. I really appreciate it. Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Associates. That's Fairwinds, F-A-I-R-E-W-I-N-D-S dot com. You're listening to 5 O'Clock Shadow.